remember the day I saw the new tunnel being drilled back in 1883. I was a reporter for the Brisbane Courier and was on the train from Bundaberg with the Queensland Premier. We left at 8 o'clock and got to Gillen's siding two hours later, a distance of 33 miles. That was as far as the railway line had been built. So we were taken by buggy for the last 10 miles by Mr McSharry of O'Rourke and McSharry. They were the contractors for the section of the railway to Mount Perry, and their headquarters at the tunnel looked more like a township than a temporary railway camp. After dinner, Sir Thomas and the others inspected the tunnel, each armed with a candle, and took a great interest in the working of the Ingersoll drill, which was in operation. The tunnel was being driven through the Bull Bunda range, which was composed of solid granite, and so didn't need lining or additional support. The drill was the only one in the colony that could go successfully through granite and was working at both ends of the tunnel, with both of the machines being operated from one engine at the eastern end. The power was obtained by means of compressed air supplied through pipes from the engine. And one great advantage of the drills is that the air, after being used, escaped and ventilated the tunnel, thus saving the cost of making air shafts. When the party entered the tunnel, the drill had been placed in position in an almost incredibly short time it bored a long hole into the hard granite, which it entered at the rate of from one to two inches per minute. The amount of pressure upon each drill averaged about 60 pounds to the inch, and each drill required three men to drive it. Then shortly before 3 p.m., Sir Thomas was again on the road, being driven over the mountainous track to Mount Perry, where he received a most hearty welcome from the residents, complete with flags, ribbons, bouquets, and a banquet. Can you imagine the excitement? Finally, after years of lobbying, speeches, petitions, newspaper articles, the very first railway trip from Bundaberg to Mount Perry. It was such a great occasion that a public holiday was declared and 400 people travelled on the train to Mount Perry. They arrived to see a pretty triumphal arch, besides which were the school children of the mining centre, looking all so neat and trim. Hearty cheers filled the air and reverberated amongst the valleys around. A grand lunchtime banquet for 250 people was held in the Oddfellows Hall, with tables lavishly spread with all the dainties available and flowers and fruits decorated aboard. The Mayor proposed a toast, success to the Bundaberg and Mount Perry Railway, while Mr Goodwin of the Bundaberg and Mount Perry Mail read an ode he had composed in celebration of the opening. We meet today amidst these hills clad in their glorious robes of living green, beneath whose surface lies the glittering ore. With the iron way together links the land of agriculture on the sea, where the great Mother Earth uprears with joy the teeming wealth from rich, juice-giving cane. It was inevitable that the government decided to close the railway line. Although it served the town very well for over 70 years, there was just not enough passengers and goods traffic had declined. Over 100 people attended a protest meeting in 1957, but the decision was made. In October 1960, the service came to an end when the rail motor made its last journey, leaving Bundaberg with seven passengers, parcels and mail. Forty passengers made the final trip back to Bundaberg with six of the town's oldest residents. Mrs V. Robinson reflected the general attitude in this poem published in 1961. She stood there old, brown and dejected, where the glittering line swung away. We clustered around her in silence, for this was her farewell day. Dear old motor, how often to Bundy, with our ports and blankets we'd go. Now these times are finished forever. No more will you take us about. Our lifeline is gone. We wish we're on the last rail motor out. give you some idea of the conditions that the men worked under when they were putting the railway line through. 
things improved later, but early railway fettlers worked in pretty harsh conditions. They lived in tents, and when they finished one section of the line, they moved on to the next section. They took the tent with them. They'd worked through rain, floods, heat waves. Uh, there were no cars or trucks. Sometimes they'd move along the line with their gear on trolleys called pumpers. They were a three-wheel trolley and they worked by the men pushing a T-shaped handle backwards and forwards. They'd normally go out working for a week or a fortnight, depending on how far they were from their base. Their wife and kids had to stay behind. They had to build the tracks, the bridges and culverts. They didn't have no modern tools. They used to drill the holes by hand, lift the rails by hand, lift the wooden sleepers. So, you know, it was a rough day out there. And then the sun. There's no shade, so they had to have plenty of water to keep their bodies working. They were tough people, I reckon. Then after a whole day's work, they'd go back to a little rough camp. They had bush showers made of a tin with holes in it. A very quick shower, a cold shower sometimes. At night all they had was a hurricane light, the kerosene lantern. Yep, that's the life of the hard-working fettlers.